Cindy Miner comes to share with us a special song this morning, especially for Father's Day. We're looking for a few good men. dying world could use is a willing man of God who dares to go against the grain and works without applause a man who raised the shield of faith protecting what is pure whose love is tough and gentle a man whose word is sure God doesn't need an orator Who knows just what to say He doesn't need authorities To reason him away He doesn't need an army To guarantee a win he just needs a few good men. Men full of compassion, who laugh and love and cry. Men who face eternity and aren't afraid to die. Men who fight for freedom and honor once again. Just needs a few good men. He calls the broken derelict whose life has been renewed. He calls the one who has the strength to stand up for the truth. Enlistment lines are open, and he wants you to come in. He just needs a few good men Men full of compassion Who laugh and love and cry Men who face eternity And aren't afraid to die Men who fight for freedom And honor once again just needs a few good men. Men full of compassion who laugh and love and cry. Men who face eternity and aren't afraid to die. Men who fight for freedom and honor once again. Just needs a few good men. Men who find passion, who laugh and love and cry. Men who face eternity and aren't afraid to die. Men who fight for freedom and honor once again. Just needs a few good men. He just needs a few good men. He just needs a few. Well, we're in a series of sermons where we're looking at the Ten Commandments and we're going to do something radical today. Are you ready for radical? We're going to skip ahead uh, because we're ready for the Third Commandment. But really, to, since it's Father's Day, I thought we really ought to do the Fifth Commandment, don't you suppose? Honor your father and your mother. So that's what we're going to do. So don't be jarred by this. We'll go back and pick up the other ones. We're not going to miss anything. We've got a whole summer to look at those. So that's what we're going to do here with the Ten Commandments. Part three, parents. Taylor, are you listening? Parents. Honored. Thank you very much. I'm getting very specific these days. Very specific. All right. 
Thank you. <laughs> well, have you ever wondered what it must have been like for Adam and Eve? I mean, think about it. They were the first married couple ever with no role models for how to build a marriage. No self-help books, no Dr. Phil to clue them in on the finer points of how to be a good husband and wife. So they had to, they had to learn as they went along about uh, which direction toilet paper is supposed to hang and, and, and where you squeeze a tube of toothpaste from and how very, very, very important it is to say you're sorry. It took time. They must have gotten it right, though, because they ended up with two sons, Cain and Abel, which also made them the first parents in the history of mankind, which I would call a double whammy, wouldn't you? Oh, my gosh. Consider no disposable diapers, no bottles, no good night moon, no resources on how to handle potty training, let alone the strong-willed child. They just had to start doing it by trial and error, which... If you think about it, it's actually standard operating procedure for most of us who have been blessed to become parents, is it not? <laughs> and sometimes you get it right. And other times you don't, whether it's about manners or sharing toys, about chewing with your mouth closed or not hitting back, or even about God and who he is and why it's important for each of us to know him and to love him. I wonder how... Adam and Eve introduced their sons to God. If they ever had a sit down with the boys and explained exactly why it was they were not living in the Garden of Eden. Did they let Cain and Abel know how very human they were? How easily tempted by the serpent? How God had, had banished them from paradise for eating forbidden fruit? It's hard for us parents sometimes to let our kids see how fallible we are. That we don't have all the answers, that the things we teach is right are not always the things we do ourselves. Of course, I hear eventually that your kids figure all that out about you, but it gives us pause for consideration, doesn't it? What we do know, based on the book of Genesis, is that the first parents did teach the first children about God and how to build a relationship with Him, to honor Him. To thank him for his daily provisions in their lives. That's what leads to the big dispute between Cain and Abel. They both brought offerings to the Lord. Grain and the, and the fatty portions from some of the firstborn sheep. And Abel's offering was accepted by God. But Cain's was rejected. Something about the quality of the offerings and the true intentions. The hearts of the givers. Well anyway, Cain is furious over this. And the Lord speaks to him about it in Genesis chapter 4, which reveals the intimacy with the creator that existed from the beginning. And God counsels Cain to do what's right. And he warns him that sin is crouching at his door, ready to pounce. Does Cain heed the warnings? No. He lets the rage get the best of him and bashes his brother's skull in making him the first murderer in history, making Adam and Eve the first parents to have to figure out how in the world do you ever survive the death of a child? And I wonder in those first days, after they buried Abel and Cain had been banished by God, in the long watches of the night, back when the world was new, if that first husband and wife played the blame game, beat themselves up because they took Cain's pacifier away too soon or, or let him stay up too late playing video games instead of obeying the, the bedtime curfew. Did Eve ever say to Adam, if only you'd hug Cain more and spanked him less? Did Adam ever say to Eve, if you hadn't listened to the serpent, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Grief can make you say terrible things sometimes. No doubt it gnawed away at them. They must, have, they must have failed somehow. Even back then, they sensed it. I mean, isn't it always the parents' fault? Truth be told, a lot of times it actually is our fault. Uh, yours and mine. Because every parent 
from Adam and Eve on down, is a sinner, a fallen creature, telling our kids that they are not the center of the universe while secretly believing that somehow we are. Let's face it, we fumbled the ball. I googled, I do that, you know. I, I'm very technologically savvy, actually. I googled the top 10 mistakes parents make. And some of them, some of them really hit home. We often overindulge our children. We give them too many choices. We lay down rules that we do not enforce. Uh-oh. We fail to spend quality time with them. We catch them being bad, but overlook them being good. We may be overcritical of our children, comparing them unfavorably with siblings or friends. We may shame them or, or blame them into submission and then wonder why they end up stressed and depressed. Did you recognize yourself in there somewhere? Uh-oh. It isn't that we don't get a lot of things right, we do. It's just we also get a lot of things wrong. And it can cause problems sometimes. But here's the good news. You ready for good news over here in the overflow room? Yep! <laughs> the good news is that God knows all about our, us parent types. And he loves us anyway. He's been dealing with flawed parents since Adam and Eve. Since Rebecca favored Jacob over Esau and caused a huge family divide. Since Jacob favored Joseph over the other boys and nearly led to fratricide. Since David went light on his sons who needed a firmer hand and nearly lost his kingdom over it. All the way down to you and me. Not only does God still love us, but he also chooses to elevate us in our positions as parents. Indeed, he makes how we are to be treated by our children an actual commandment. It's in the top ten for Pete's sake. Last week we looked at the second commandment about not making idols to worship. No golden calves, remember? And as we talked about that in my Sunday school class afterwards, it's interesting that the, that's the only commandment that comes with the promise of punishment if it's broken. The only one. None of the others do that. Not even, not even murder. But today in, in the fifth commandment, this one turns out to be the only one that comes with a specific promise of blessing if it's kept. Let's look at what it says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Here's the commandment. Honor your father and your mother. And then here's the promise of blessing. So that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Ooh, pretty cool blessing, right? If you keep it. Now, why do you suppose God sends parents apart in the commandments for special honor and respect? I think it's because he set us apart for a special purpose. To help establish in the minds of our children that there is a power greater than themselves. An authority above their own. Parents are called to provide guidelines and boundaries for their children. To teach them the difference between right and wrong. Hold them accountable for their actions. To remind them regularly that they are not in charge. This prepares them for life, doesn't it? For going to school and having to submit to the authority of teachers and administrators. Gets them ready to head out. Onto their career paths where there will be bosses and supervisors. But most importantly, it paves the way for our children to understand what it means to be in a loving relationship with God, the Heavenly Father. The call to submit their wills to His will, to embrace His rules rather than making up their own for their own good. Just like they must do with us, their parents. This was the assignment God gave to the parents of Israel while the commandments were still warm on the tablets. He speaks to them directly about it, a message which is recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning at verse number 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Right after the Ten Commandments have been given, this is what God says. Hear, O Israel, 
The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Comprehensive, isn't it? So part of what parents do to help their children learn about God is to keep his commandments, his expectations ever before them. To live them out. So our kids see the impact they've had on us. So they see what it means when it says we aren't supposed to tell lies. Or take things that don't belong to us. Or worship our possessions more than we do the one who provides them. The commandments teach that adultery is forbidden. Parents are called to live that out in front of their children by keeping their vows to each other as husband and wife. By keeping them pointed upward, even if the morals of society or current trends or popular ways are all going south. This is what God commands us to do. And children are to honor us because of it. Of course, that's not all there is to it. It's certainly about creating an awareness of an authority in their lives. That's essential. But it's also about living out in real time how much God loves them. Using our arms to stand in for his, to reach for them, to hold them close, to lift them up on our shoulders, delighting in the sheer wonder of them. We point the way to our protecting God when we respond to their cries for help, scoop them up from danger, deliver them from harm's way. We reveal something about the comforting God when we rock them gently when they're sad or scared. When we invite them to snuggle in bed with us when the two o'clock thunderstorm goes through. When we sing songs to them and whisper words of affection and affirmation to them. And make the sacrifices parents have to make sometimes to be sure their kids have what they need. After all, making sacrifices for his children is what God, God's all about, isn't he? Making the ultimate sacrifice of his only begotten son that all who come to know him as Lord can be free. Jesus himself notes the role fathers play in helping their kids know who God is and how much he desires to bless them. Listen to what he says in the Sermon on the Mount. It's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, beginning at verse number 7. He draws an interesting analogy here between earthly dads and the heavenly father. First of all, he says... If you have need, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door might be opened? No, will be opened. And then he says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, give him a stone? Not usually, right? If they want bread, you usually give him bread. Or if he asks for a fish, go and give him a snake. Boom! Not cool. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Oh, there's a distinction there, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Jesus notes that human fathers are evil. That sounds kind of harsh, doesn't it? Oh, gee. But we're fallen, aren't we? And we're sinful, and we're flawed, and we're prone to mistake making. That uh, that we're really a long way from being God ourselves. We don't always respond with patience and grace. Sometimes we blow our stacks, or we overlook what's needed, or 
listen up, Benz, or, or we disappear in our work so that somebody else has to deal with some of the messy stuff our kids do. Did I hear any ouchies out there? Ouchie! We walk on feet of play, but hopefully our, for our kids, the best of us is what makes the biggest impact. I like what David Drucker, a political correspondent for the Washington Examiner, had to say about his dad in a recent Father's Day tribute. Here's what he, what he wrote, quote, My father, a first-generation American, born in 1933 in Chicago, and who later served in the U.S. Army during the Korean War, yelled. He yelled a lot. Ron Drucker was a passionate, emotional man. Even when he didn't yell, his booming baritone voice spoke with such definitive authority that he might as well have been yelling, as far as I was concerned. He was not the easiest man to live with, to say the least. I didn't agree with everything he did. I didn't like everything he did. And our relationship could be contentious. As I grew into adulthood, that meant that when he yelled, I yelled right back. But... My father lived his life with integrity. He taught me how to stand on my own two feet. Taught me what self-respect was. Taught me to never ever quit. He taught me how to love a woman and how to care for a family. He taught me how to be a father by loving me enough to not care whether I liked him because he knew he was raising me to be a man." End quote. Ron Drucker was an imperfect father to be sure, but his son doesn't focus on that in that piece, does he? He honors his father by celebrating the good examples that he set and the important things that he taught his son, even if he yelled a lot while he was doing it. And maybe that's a good insight for us on how to best keep that fifth commandment. Maybe it's about children at whatever age catching their parents being good. Adopting what we told them about if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Approaching us with grace the same way we try to approach them an extension of a gracious God. Maybe one of the best ways children can honor their parents is to forgive us for the balls we dropped, for the signs we missed, for the times we flunked the parent test in the middle of the toy aisle at Walmart, for the wounds we inflicted by harsh words or rash punishments, by breaking some of the commandments in ways that left scars on you. Sometimes that forgiveness may take a lifetime. There are, to be sure, some, some really bad parents out there, aren't there? But forgiveness is always worth pursuing because it holds the potential to help you heal and maybe rebuild a broken relationship in the process. Maybe. Maybe kids can honor their parents by taking care of them when the need is there. We parent types are often living to ripe old ages these days. And stuff that used to work in our minds or our bodies may not work quite so well. At some point, we may need your help, the way we helped you when you were weak and vulnerable. I look out in our congregation, and I recognize we have many adult children who are doing an amazing job caring for aging parents, and, and thus are they keeping the fifth commandment well and being a good witness to other adult children in our midst. And perhaps, Here's my theory. You ready for my theory? Write this down. Nobody picked up a pencil. I mean, I don't know. Elaine's got her... <laughs> Elaine's taking notes for you people. See Elaine after the service. Perhaps we have so many folks in our church who are living to be in their 90s and beyond because they too did a good job keeping commandment number five. After all, 
it does come with that promise, you know, the one about living a long life in the land the Lord gave you. And that's something for all of us to think about as we ponder the Ten Commandments today. As we ponder what it means in our own lives to respect, to value, to honor our father and our mother. <laughs>